even today, like whenever I hear the national anthem, it just it's just so moving for me. You know, again, red, white, represent the red, white, and blue, going out and being able to do that and stand for your country and stand together as a unit at that point in time for me was very emotional. From Fiore Communications, it's How I Got Here, a show of inspiring stories from Tallahassee area leaders, business owners, and neighbors, all the challenges, opportunities, inspirations, the twists and turns of life that led them to where they are today. Everyone has a story worth telling, and I am really grateful that we get to bring a few of them to you. I truly have been changed by my conversations with these amazing people, and I'm confident you will be too. I'm Dave Fiore. In this episode, I talk with Mycel Green, a successful communications professional who helped guide members of the Talcorn Electric Cooperative through two recent hurricanes. She's a devoted wife and mom and respected community leader. And oh yeah, she's also an Olympic gold medalist with a heart for encouraging young women to follow their dreams. We started our conversation with a question about her early years. I know you were born in Indianapolis, fellow Hoosier. Yes, I am. I was Go. born in uh, West Lafayette, yes. Indiana. Go Hoosiers. Um, actually, I just I just made my kids watch part of the movie Hoosiers. They had never seen it. No. <laughs> I, have you ever seen it? I did. Yeah, I, I did. mean, that's mm-hmm. like the greatest. And it, it's sort of true. I it think. is. It is. Yeah. I actually ran a couple of meets in, in that um, facility. Oh, really? I did. That's and, awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love that movie. Anyway, so uh, you were born in Indianapolis. Um, just kind of tell me, I just want to get a feel for your family, parents, siblings, your just kind of family life, your situation um, when you were young. My family still lives, some family lives in Indianapolis. And then the um, I have a sister that lives in California. So I have two sisters. And um, like I said, one lives in California, one lives in Indianapolis. Um, my mother and my stepfather, and then my father, and then my stepmother, they live in Atlanta. So, But most of my family still lives in Indianapolis. Okay. And where are you in the sibling order? I'm number, I'm number, uh, I'm the middle. I'm number two. The middle. So I'm the, I'm the knee baby, what they call the knee <laughs> That's baby. That's right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So what was your situation growing up? Well, I... Unfortunately, by, by the age of I think twelve or thirteen, um, became a single. It was a single parent home. My mother raised myself and my two sisters, so we would. I would probably say um, we were middle class at one point, but then we, you know, after my father um, left, it you know it, it became a little less than that. So, but I really never knew what it was. You know, mm-hmm. you know, I knew that we couldn't do certain things, but we were never without. We were never without. So um, if I look at it now, we were probably less than the middle class. We were left in the middle. Right. But it's just the way things were. Yes. Right? Yeah. Didn't feel like you were missing out on anything huge. It was just the way it was. It was. And it, the thing was is that we always went to great schools and we were around, around great people who that helped embody um who you were and successes and nobody actually judged you off of what you didn't have. But I didn't realize what I didn't have until after I probably went to college and there were less things that I was capable of getting. But um, my mother kept us in the good school systems and around good people. And she did, you know, she worked for um, Chevrolet at the time. So she was a factory worker. Um, And we knew that some things were hard. But like I said, we didn't go without food, water, or shelter. And, you know, and so, you know, most of what we consider the basics, that's just what we knew. Yeah. Do you know what your mom specifically did in the factory? Actually, she used to make trucks. Oh, wow. She used to make trucks, the panels and different things like that. She, she, you know, would press those parts and throw them up on the um, assembly line and different things like that. So it sounds hard. I mean, it physically was, tough. It was, it was physically hard, and and you didn't know that. You know, you just thought it was a cool job because your mom worked at Chevy at the plant. <laughs> you know, being right. from the Midwest, you know, that was a big deal because yeah. you knew, then you had Detroit, you know, where they were manufacturing and things like that. So, and my dad 
at the time, he worked for Ford. So my mom worked for Chevy, my mom. And, uh, Did that dad cause problems in the family <laughs> not, at the time? No, not at the time. Later. <laughs> later, it probably caused problems because I ended up buying a, a Honda. But it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was probably the safest thing is rather than picking sides. Yes. Um, all right. And, you know, I know from knowing you and and, and from reading about you that you were a, a world-class track athlete. So we'll get into that later. But that had to mean at some point, I assume you started running as a child. And so that had to make your your childhood a little less than typical if you were a committed athlete at some point. So tell me about that and when that all kind of started to crank up and, and how that impacted your childhood. Well, I started when uh, every summer my mother used to send me, send my, me and my sisters to Evanston, Illinois. And when we would go there, my grandmother had us to become part of the Boys and Girls Club. And at the Boys and Girls Club, they had running. They had a track program. And every year, um, they would have competitions. And one, and one of the competitions, if you were successful enough and were, you had won some races to go to the, the, you know, the different divisions up, you would run at what they called the, the Dyke Stadium for July 4th celebration. And that's actually where I started running, you know, just for fun, you know, and I was winning races. And so <laughs> that makes I, it more fun. Yeah. Right? So I didn't realize that it would take me to the places I'd, I would later go in life. But I actually started back then at in Evanston, Illinois, at the Dyke Stadium for the July 4th celebration. That was a big deal. I just wanted to get ribbons. I wanted to run at the stadium and have all the all the uh, fireworks and everything. So but That's pretty amazing. I mean, a summer camp, basically, right? Yes. A boys and girls club yes. starting to run, mm-hmm. and that's how it all started. Yes. So when you got back, did you start on, like, middle school or high school track teams? Well, in middle school, there was a, an amazing man. His name was um, the, uh, Mr. Ross, Warren Ross. He was our counselor there. And he actually seen me run, I believe, in probably some field day events. And then I went out for the, you know, he recommended that I go out for the track team, the middle school track team there at West Lane, at West Lane Middle School. And I went out for the track team and I ran some races and I was winning. And he contacted a good friend of his, his um, of his name, Pete Jones. And he had a track club, which was in Terre Haute, Indiana. Mm-hmm. And so he asked, um, he asked me one, uh, you know, my, my mother and I, if I could come out to the track one day so Pete could watch me run. And, um, uh, that particular day, I think it was a Saturday, Pete came out and Mr. Warren was there. We were at the track at West Lane and they took me, he told me he wanted me to run. So he took me down to the start of the 100 meter mark. So I went down to the start of 100 meter mark and he said, you know, when he waved his arm, told me to, you know, dropped it, then, you know, run. So he did that. He, he, he timed me. And he looked at his watch, and he looked a little bit confused. <laughs> so he he asked me, he goes, did you start at the right line? I was like, yes, sir. Is this for 100 meters? The 100 meters. Right. And so he then walked me down to the starting line. He was like, did you start at this <laughs> line? I was like, yes, sir. So he was like, okay, stay right there, and I'm going to go to the finish line. So he did that a second time. So, And I ran, and I ran faster. <laughs> so, show him yeah, where so I was like, okay, here it is. Right. So he was like, okay, that was pretty amazing. And that probably started, that did start my track career. Okay. So that actually officially started my track career because at that point in time, I was able to um, be a part of a track club and we were, we were able to travel at that point. You were obviously good at running, but would you say you were passionate about it? Is it something that you came to love or... How, what was your relationship with it at the beginning like that? I enjoyed running. It didn't, it wasn't, I mean, I had to work hard and um, it was hot on days. And then I'm from Indianapolis. It was cold on days when I had to train, but I enjoyed it because I guess I didn't um, have to work as hard, you know, and it came easy to me. Let's just say that. And then I enjoyed running with the people that were around me. So I did, I, I had a passion for it. Now, I mean, did you did they make you stay on a certain diet? I mean, was it super training? Was that a big deal? It wasn't. It's not like it is today, which is I think I would have totally been probably a much greater athlete. I say I tell myself <laughs> that anyway. Um, I didn't. I was I ate junk food. I, I did. It was terrible. <laughs> you know, when I look back, I'm like, what? I was eating um 
Captain Crunch with berries. <laughs> I was eating, you know, and that was like my breakfast of champions and at not the even time. Wheaties. No, I mean, it no. wasn't Wheaties, you know, yeah. breakfast of champions. And um, and then, you know, uh, actually at the races, I remember having a Snicker and a Pepsi. You know, I think it, everything that I did so wrong, you know, nobody told me any different because it was like, you know, She's doing great. This is what she's eating. Let her keep doing it kind of thing. And nobody at the time said, you know, nutritional, you need to change your nutritional habits right here. And right. so I was just eating whatever, you know, my mom cooked and prepared. And, you know. It worked. It did at the time. <laughs> yeah. It did. Okay. So I um, I know you ended up at Arizona State. Yes. And so I assume something, and you must have been successful at some point in high school to get somebody's attention all the way out in Arizona. So. Tell me about that. I mean, did you start winning meets and and also did you start transitioning? Because I know you're a 440 runner. Did you start transitioning into other races or did you did you just kind of run everything or tell me about that? Well, um, in high school, I ran everything from the 100, 200, 400 meters. And so um, I was a state champion 11 out of the 12 times that I actually competed at state. And I, I broke um, the records in the 100, 200, and 400. And so I was highly recruited during my, um, actually, I think started my, my junior year. Sophomore, but junior year, it, um, it really took off. So I was recruit, widely recruited by the all the top schools in the country. Like what were some of your other options? Um, uh, LSU, University of Houston, um, Arizona State, UCLA, wow. USC, uh, it, I guess it was, you did it was have a your plethora. Pick. It, was yeah. a, it was a plethora of schools that you know that I had to choose from. From Florida, University of Florida. Um, well, you showed <laughs> great wisdom in not choosing that one. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. so. Um, even though later I did train there, but right. I did. You know, I, like I said, at probably every major university. Um, so why Arizona State? They, at the time, they had I took. You are allowed five official visits, and I took an official visit to Arizona State, and the team there was just amazing. It was just more like a family. Uh, the coach was just amazing at the time. It was Clyde Duncan Sr., and I think he just said all the right things. And, you know, it's funny because I think probably what I know now, and I probably would have made a different decision, but it, it actually served me well to, um, to actually go out to Arizona State. Um, was it hard to leave your family? It wasn't. My mother and my sisters were are amazing because they were like, wherever you want to go, we'll just come out and visit you. And so wherever you feel comfortable and feel like you're going to, you know, succeed, not only on in track, but also in the classroom. And that was also key for me with Arizona State is because the, um, they took they they said all the right things as far as you know, making sure that I would get my degree from Arizona State. And my father was big on making sure that you know, once you go to college, you get a degree. You don't just right. go. You have to uh, get that degree. So it was a good experience? You enjoyed your time there? I did. It was good. Sun Devil for life. And <laughs> <laughs> it, um, I learned a lot being out there. I have some great friends and, and so, of course, some teammates. And uh, later I ended um, – um, we had a coaching transition. I met my coach that actually took me to the next level when I when – I, you know, making – the U.S. teams, the different U.S. teams. So okay. it was a great experience for me. That's awesome. Well, so the last where I was going to ask where I was going to go next is that um, it looks like it was about four years from the time you graduated from Arizona State to – that was 1992, right? Yeah. And the Olympics, of course, were in 96. So so what happened in that period? What, what did those four years look like? Well, it um, I have to go back up a little bit. So uh, – in 1992, that was the year that uh, that I was selected, or they thought, you know, this would I would make my I would make the first team. I'll make a breakout because I made my first team in 1988. Okay. I made my first Olympic team as a 19 year old freshman. I was an alternate for oh, the I didn't four, realize that. Yeah, for the four by four relay with all the great I icons of today um, in our sport, from Carl Lewis um, to um, uh, that. Big issue with Ben Johnson where they got drug tested right. and positive, right. and I did travel to Seoul, Korea, and um, you know Florence Griffith Joyner. It was it's just a uh, Evelyn Ashford, Edwin Moses. Those you are did. the big names. Yeah. So yeah. if you you look back in track and field, those are the icons of the sport. Right. And I was I was a baby. I was a freshman, and um, so I I didn't get to actually compete, but I did travel, and I am noted to be 
you know, that be my first Olymp- Olympic experience. And then— Did you get to march? I did. The, I did everything. The ceremonies yes, and everything? I was in the ceremony. I, was, I can't even imagine. What was that as an 18-year-old? That must have just been unbelievable. It was. I mean, because one, you're looking around at all these people who you've watched for since you were younger in, in performing these different sports. Because I got to be around every all the sports. For it was men's basketball. So remember, that was the dream team. That was dream team. That was the dream team. Yeah. I was. I you know we we're standing right next to them. We <laughs> you know the tra- track and field was right next to basketball because it's athletics. It's not track and field. So it's athletics. We're at the beginning, and then we had basketball and we had you know so we were right next to the dream team for men and women so you know that was phenomenal and I have great pictures from that from um but from the beginning so That's awesome. uh, yeah so yeah. just that experience and being in a stadium being actually traveling overseas I traveled earlier because I made my first team junior world championship team in 1987 we traveled to to Athens Greece we traveled to Romania. We traveled to some other countries. So I began traveling back in 1986. But then it continued on going to that next level in 88 was just a phenomenal opportunity because anytime you make a USA team, it is like a really big deal because a lot of the meat promoters from all around the world come to our Olympic trials because we have such a large depth of um, talent that is right. actually competing. So when did you start running? When did you start focusing on the on the four hundred and that that kind of became your race? I think um, my cho- showed uh, chose it for me. I was volunteered into the four hundred. <laughs> that wasn't your favorite race. No, I love the two hundred meters um, because I love the hundred because it was short. Um, the four hundred was too long and it was very painful. Well, I mean, I am <laughs> anything. I'm not even close to being a runner, but I remember even back in high school getting our presidential physical fitness yes, patches and yes. stuff and, and or, or running the 400. We called it the 440 because it was yards, right? Mm-hmm. One lap around the track. Of all the stuff we ran, it's like full out as fast as you can run for as long as you can possibly do it. Well, you know, it was – that's why I didn't want – that's why it wasn't my first chosen event. So <laughs> it's hard. If I can do half of the, you know, somewhere in between the one and the four, it was a 200. Um, but I think it kind of chose me because I said basically my body type, you know, however, if I could have gone back, I was stuck to the 100 and 200 and only ran the hunt, the 400 um, on the relays or something like that, because there was some, some great, amazing women who actually were taller than me. And and her name was Grace Jackson. She's an Olympic champion for Jamaica. She was six foot tall and she was an amazing 100 and 200 meter sprinter. But I did what, you know, what my coach had me do at the time. And So what do you mean by body type? What made your body better for the 400 in his opinion than the 200 or the 100? My leg length. Okay. Leg length and, it, you know, just being 5'9 and, you know, long legs. And, you know, it's just a kind of association. So if you think of certain, they they you kind of, they have certain body types that they think for, for different positions, even if it's in like football or, um, or in this case, track and field, you sure. know, short sprinters, you know, they're kind of a little bit shorter than you as a, you know, but you saying bolt again. You know, he defies that. So my, Carl Lewis. So I think it's just a, the t- the coach and where you were needed, where I was needed. So you were a time. good team player. Uh, yeah. You ran the 400 yes. and it worked out pretty well for you. It did. It did. It worked out really well for me. So when and I, this is just kind of a side question I had when I was thinking about the when you're running and you're part of the team and, and you're that's your life. How as an amateur athlete, how do you support yourself? Is that. Are you living with the team? Do they provide for your needs? Do you have to work on the side? How how does that work? Well, the key word here was amateur. You know, we're not professionals. And they've definitely changed over the years because it wasn't as lucrative as it is today. You know, we did uh, receive some stipends from the United States Olympic Committee and also USA Track and Field, but it wasn't enough to actually live on. So I actually did have some uh, part-time jobs, but then also I did have sponsorships. So I was sponsored by, um, at one point, Nike, then New Balance, and ASICS um, served as my sponsors at different points of times in my career. So it it was um so like other sports they they'll sponsor individual athletes and track the same way. They do and it's like I said it's gotten more lucrative and then of course if you um once you graduate from college uh, you have no more eligibility you can go over to the Europe and you can compete in those races and um they will actually pay you for your you know 
appearance, what they call appearance money, and then also in addition for where you, you know, your performance on the track. So tell me about Atlanta. Were you happy that it was going to be in America? Was that, did you look forward to traveling it again or were you kind of, was was it a good thing that you got to stay at home for that one? I think it was an amazing opportunity. Why? Because, you know, the world gets to come to the United States and it was the first time that the Olympic Games had not been boycotted, and we we're every all every country was going to be able to be represented because right, the previous two had been boycotted by one side or the other. Yes, right? and so this was a great opportunity, and then plus my family was going to be able to be there. They weren't, you know. So, so what did that mean to you? Oh, that was everything. That was everything because I had, you know, my family, friends, and every, you know, just growing up, you know, people could actually see it and they could actually come to the event, you know, which is a, a, a worldwide event. They could actually be a part of history right there. And for me, traveling overseas is awesome. But when you're home, you know, you're at home. This, when I say home, United States is home. Your home crowd just cheering you on, right. you know, representing the rare, white, and blue. For me, that just, um, right now, it just gives me chills. I, the one <laughs> thing I, I, you know, I, I love representing the United States of America. So that is key. So, um, as far as our training is concerned, you know, you do it on your own and then you come together at a training camp, you know, for maybe a one or two weeks at a time at a time. But no, everything is still on your own. And um, you just have your support group and everything that's there. My uh, my son was able to be there. He was a little less than four years old. <laughs> my mother was there. Um, my father and my sisters, like the, the, just everyone was there, friends and family. And just this American people, you, can, you can't imagine what it feels like to have over uh, 80,000 plus every, you know, whatever the, the number was cheering for you, USA, USA, USA. That is what's amazing to me because whatever pain you might have been feeling, you don't feel it anymore <laughs> because, you know, you have all this support group right. behind you. And the millions on TV. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah, you, you, as they say, you're repping the red, white, and blue. <laughs> so. <laughs> I was probably cheering for you and didn't even know yes. it at the time. So <laughs> exactly. That's, that's pretty awesome, too. <laughs> So I know you're individual athletes, but in in relays, you work as a team. So especially in a where a baton is involved and you're passing it, and that's that can be tricky. So the the um, relationship you have with each other and you know the familiarity and all that kind of stuff. So are teams set well in advance, and you know that the four of you are going to run together, or based on individual times, do they swap pieces out? How? How does that work? Well, the United States is very unique, and our Olympic trials basically sets that up for us. And so um, at the time, you know, the top four that finish at the Olympic trials are usually the top four that are going to be um, your relay. That get, they're going to represent you in the so finals. So the top the four relay. finishers in the 400 individual race. Yes. However, because the rules have changed just a little bit, if you are – a top four in any of your races. If you make that Olympic team, that you that World Championship team, Pan American team, in the hundred, two hundred, or four hundred, or even the four hundred hurdles, or anything like that, or two hundred, they could utilize. You get into a relay pool, and you can be selected by the coach, the or the coaching staff to be on the relay, whether it's a four by one relay or the four by four. Now, back when I was um, when I made the team, it was they usually go off the top with the top four, the top six. And then the, um, whoever plays fifth and sixth will be the alternates and would run in the preliminary rounds. Right. And so for me, I actually won the Olympic trials. So I, um, though, you know, since I won at that time, I was kind of like an uh, automatic on the on the relay, but I won't say any nothing's automatic. But right. yes, at that time, I was going to be on the relay because I won the Olympic trial. So, so how did that feel to win the trials? That must have been pretty awesome. It was amazing because I had just came off of having my son less than four years ago. Wow. So uh, it was um, an amazing comeback. My coach at the time, he has now since passed away, Tom Jones. Um, we had a really great relationship. He believed in me and my 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 dream of going being on the Olympic team and winning the trials. So I had just probably two two, two weeks prior to the Olympic trials that year, I, I rolled my ankle. I popped my ankle mm -hmm. really bad. It was a very bad sprain. Um and I 
and wasn't sure if I was going to be able to make it through, but I had an amazing trainer, Randy Brower, who actually um, worked with me and my coach to actually make sure that I was there. And not only was I there, but I won the Olympic trial. So I had a couple of setbacks, things that, you know, I could allow to defeat me, but I didn't. And um, to win the Olympic trials, and then I was named the athlete of the meet on, on that particular day, and be able to celebrate with my family. You know, at the time, it was just an amazing opportunity, and you just is is something that you just never forget. World class athlete as a mom, you know. I mean, of course, we Serena is a big deal now after what she accomplished actually while she was pregnant and afterwards. Mm-hmm. But um, that's pretty awesome. I mean, that I imagine there aren't a lot of of your colleagues who had been moms? Well, no, not at the time. It was I was very unique in that in that sense. Actually, I didn't realize it, but in 1992, when I won the national championship in the 400 meters indoor, uh, I didn't realize I was pregnant at the time, and I didn't. <laughs> so, and it wasn't until actually. So you carried your son across the finish I did. line as well. He's yeah. a national champion in the, in the women's 400 with me right there. <laughs> so, and um, so you know what you know once I found out and I was like, okay, um, what is this going to look like for my track career? And my coach was like, oh, you're just going to come back and start running. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so, again, team player, like, okay, coach, whatever you ask me to do, that's that's, that's the way it is. Right. So, you know, so he was like, you know, it, it had, there wasn't very many people at that level that had done that before. And that had been, at least it wasn't... Um, no one spoke spoke about it. You know, it wasn't something right. that everybody said, talks about to date. But I was one of the first to actually do it and um, come back afterwards and actually perform better wow. than I did when I was actually, you know, before I had had my son. And so, what do you attribute that to? Um, just the de- de- the dedication of wanting and um, the commitment to wanting my son to see his mom, you know, reach her goals and know that hard work you know, on the track, off the track, will pay off. And, I, you know, for my son, it was a drive of, of You were him. running for, for yeah, him. Yeah, I was. It's just, I, it just having him share in that moment and see that his mom, you know, can do it, can overcome whatever challenges that I faced. And he would have been old enough to understand what was going on, too. I mean, he, at, at four, right? Yeah, you know, he actually, if you go back and look, um, when uh, Bob Costas closed out the Olympics um, back in Atlanta, he actually used, you know, had my son's image and was waving by and said, you know, we're, we're saying so long from the 1996 Olympic Games. And my son was actually the one who was waving. And, oh. and so it was, I was like, you got more publicity than I did. But, you know, it's all good. It's all good. So, you know, and that was pretty amazing. So. Yeah. Well, I just did want to touch on just to see if it impacted you at all and that the tragedy of the Olympics with the bomb going off in, um, in the park. Um, were you still around that area when that happened or how did that, did that impact you in any way? It did because I was actually staying at the Hyatt Regency at the time. Mm. And so, which was right down the street from it. So it just, you know, they sealed off everything. They wanted to make sure all the athletes were good. I wasn't, I didn't stay in the village at the time because I wanted to stay with my family and which, you know, that was important just to keep that mindset relaxed. But it, it, you know, to be in an um, in a part of an event like the Olympic Games, and somebody was coming there to basically destroy all the goodness mm. of it, it, it just is really heartbreaking to know that you know there are people out there that you know don't like to see you know the unity happen because we have you know as the rings represent the continents, the five continents of the world to come together, you know, in one area and. It, it, it'd be good. It, it was just, it was, it was sad. It was a very sad moment for our country, but like we always do, we're resilient. We bounce back and we show them that we can overcome, mm-hmm. you know, one person's negativity. So for me, it was like, okay, well, we're going to make sure that we do better now at in Atlanta and let them know that we can rise up and overcome this, this one person's negativity. So I, I know it's awesome to be on an Olympic team, and it's, you know, an honor to be part of it, but you won a gold medal. <laughs> so that's um, that's even better. That had to be pretty cool here in the national anthem, the whole process. Um, tell me how it feels to win a gold medal at the Olympics. Well, it was amazing. Again, we, um, I won, we won the gold medal in the United States of America. We 
we overcame all odds, odds and obstacles. We had the bombing. We had all those other things happen. I ha- actually have forgot to mention I had a migraine. Mm-hmm. And um, that migraine set me back pretty good. Or did the bombing happen before you ran? Before we ran, a, before we ran a relay. Okay. You know, but it's somewhere in between. I think it was right after the finals or before the finals of the four four hundred. I can't remember. Um. So. She had a migraine too. Oh yeah, I suffer from migraines really bad. It was bad. I was throwing up. I couldn't see light. It was horrible. But uh, my teammate, Jerome Miles Clark, she was like, she was like, she she really wanted me to make sure that I was I was. You know, she wanted me on the team with her to run because we actually trained on the same track together in Gainesville. Um, so to to be a part of a group of women who actually wanted you to be there with them because they have faith in you and they knew your your skill set at the t- you know your, your abilities and um, to be out there to represent represent the United States together that was huge. Mm-hmm. Then we won the Olympics. You know, we won the gold medal we in front of everyone in Atlanta, hot Atlanta <laughs> at the time. And it was amazing like my son, I had my family again my family there. My son got to share in the experience with me. It was very surreal. I cried because I was like I actually got was my dream that I set back in when I was in middle school. Yeah. And um, so when you accomplish that dream, like the reality of it and not overcoming the, it, uh, the, the ankle, I sprained my ankle, remember, right. and just those adversities, I just, I had nothing but tears left. I had smiles and joys. So that was exciting. But then, you know, you get to hear that national anthem, you sing it, even today, like whenever I hear the national anthem, it just, it's just so moving for me. You know, again, red, white, represent the red, white, and blue, going out and being able to do that and stand for your country and stand together as a unit at that point in time for me was very emotional. And then, of course, we got to do the victory lap before we actually got on the stand. And um, so my son got to actually do the victory lap with me. He got to come down he, on the track? He did. That's, he did. He was cool. on the track with me. Wow. He ran. He did his whole lap. And you're and carrying the flag around? Yes, carried no. the flag around. He actually had on a red, white, and blue outfit. I actually <laughs> bought it because I was like, we're going to win. You know, we're going to, he's going to be a Smart part of that. Smart mom. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so a street vendor out in Atlanta, I bought that from you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, and we got to be a part of that. And he knows Gerald Miles. Because, like I said, we trained on the same track in Gainesville together. Right. And she reached out and gave him a hug when she had the flag. And actually, that picture made the uh, center of uh, Sports Illustrated back at the time. So, again, once again, he got more publicity <laughs> more than I did. Time <laughs> he than did, yeah. he did. Yeah. So, just that whole, th- this, it's amazing to actually be a part of that. Just to have the crowd roar you through to victory and so you know just cheering you on and now, was it and a close race it was close well you know with the relay it kind of you're not sure you're, right. you're like up and down up and down you know um but each leg was something different and which leg did you run? i ran the second i love second leg and i i just um we were actually i think in sixth place when i got the baton and you know and um i could probably could i probably would have ran a, should have ran a smarter race but it, you know i ran it well enough at that time and and um pulled us within um i think second or third place i can't remember and then our third leg kim graham actually did a phenomenal job of closing the gap and then Jerome miles came and finished it and then when she crossed the line i mean i could do is this grabber and hold her and like you know just it just playing off of each other it was just amazing and even you know even now and i can watch it on youtube just and i don't watch it often at all but somebody bring it to my attention like my right. husband <laughs> and he's um, proud of you That's he okay. is very he is yeah. very um and it, it brings back chills because I can remember and I count for each moment, you know, from when you pass the baton, you know, you grab it, you you got to wait for your incoming runner. You you, you got to make sure you're gauging that properly. You get the baton, you you know, we get it in our left hand on the four by four and you switch it to your right. And then everything then is just a, at goal, you know, right. and the, you hear the crowd, but you don't hear the crowd. You see, you target the person that's in front of you, you know, and make sure you're not. Over, you know, the person behind you is not catching you either. So it's, 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 it's right. some strategy into that. But, you know, that in itself is just phenomenal, you know. And so standing on the victory stand with the world watching and knowing you're representing everybody there at that moment. And so like you were cheering for me, yep. I felt the cheers. Hey, everybody. Just a quick reminder that this episode is brought to you by Fiori Communications. 
Just like people, every business has a story to tell, and we've been helping our clients tell their story since 2001, because who you are as a company is just as important as what you do. To learn more about how telling your story can make a difference in your business, visit FioriCommunications.com. Thanks again for listening. Now back to the show. You gave up running and then um, your first job, you stayed in the track and field world by taking a job at FSU as an assistant track coach? Yes. And so my coach, like I said, Tom Jones was an instrumental part of my life and he was my son's godfather. He was, you know, trying to help me navigate to what my next steps were. He thought coaching would be good for me because I always like giving back. Always like giving back. I'm always helping someone else, you know, do this, do this, do this. So whatever I learned, I tried to make sure that they knew so they didn't have to go through the same issues. You know, let's just you know, learn from me, <laughs> you know, right. kind of thing. Don't eat junk food. Yes, right? don't do that. Part. So, yeah, they all the things I did, I'm like, no, you can't do it. <laughs> and so he helped me, and then I began my career as a coach um, at um, Florida State University. Okay. And then from there, you went on, as an assistant coach there, you went on to become the head coach at FAMU. Yes. So what what was that like? It was amazing. I, I my the athletes are just amazing in general. But you know, being over at Florida A and M, I had a great group of young girls that were eager to learn how to be um, become great in a sport that they loved. So because we had that love together, um, they were they listened. They were very good students of of track and field, and because of that, I was trying to make sure that I learned a lot. So I think I coached everything in the. Um, in the track and field world, except pole vault. So I learned how because <laughs> I was a one woman yeah, show at one point over there. Oh, wow. So yeah, that was tough. Yeah, I think you would have had to do the pole vault to help somebody with it, right? In my opinion, yes. So. <laughs> so, and you weren't interested in trying no, it. No, right? yeah. I and I just had someone who was um, a former gentleman who was a, a pole vaulter for Fam who came over and helped them. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> thankfully, so yeah. All right, and then from okay, so from there. Um, you kind of got out of the track and field coaching business and I started to pursue some other things and you ended up at um, ITT Technical, right? Institute in Communications. And it seems like that kind of launched you into your your next career as a communications professional. So how did how did that happen, and and how did you end up in that sp- in that place? Well, I have my undergrad in communication. The, my undergrad degree is in communication. So that's helpful. <laughs> so, but nobody ever knew it because my sports career took off so well, and then my master's is in sports management. Okay. So it kind of combined itself being a coach. So you were recruiting. And so, you know, you're communicating, but you're also selling the university. You're selling yourself, the university, and everything that kind of encompasses that. So that's kind of, I've always used communication, but I didn't think about it till like later in my, I'm like, I've always been there. So I kind of just kind of use that because when you have to sell the university that you're at and sell yourself to parents, the parent, the athlete, and the coaches, and in other stu- uh, uh, student athletes that are out there, it, you have to have some pretty good communication skills, relationship building skills, and you got to be able to um, share with them why that would be a great connection for you and being a part of the, that particular culture and atmosphere. So, yeah, that's kind of where it kind of took off a little bit, but it, it did start when I was coaching that communication. Right, using department. some of those same skills. Yes, so using that. Just I'm taking more of a, mm, an, I would say, an outward stance on um, get, being in communication now, just kind of getting out in that world now. So how did you end up at Talcoin? How did that opportunity present itself? Well, I was working at a uh, Career Source Capital Region, right. and um, I was working with a lot of the businesses in the community. I was working on the business development side of, of Career Source, and they had a job opportunity that came up that um, they asked to, as their account executive to for me to post. And then when my supervisor at the time was like, "You can't apply for that job." I was like, "Well, <laughs> I was like, I didn't even read the job description. Well, what is it?" But and now so, I'm gonna look. Yeah. And so then that's exactly what happened. So then I looked at it. I was like, "Oh, why not apply?" And it was like the day before it was the closing. Oh. Uh-uh. So, um, so I it, that's actually how. So I was it's, it's utilizing all the skills that I have been, you know, um, privy to to learn along the way. 
Mm-hmm. And um, so I always say God has a, sen- a very good sense of humor with me because he, you know, I have a good, very good pattern, you know, that um, quilt that has different patterns. So right. that's what my life looks like. So and that's how I ended up at, at Talquin Electric okay. is, is kind of. I assume you were not an expert in electric cooperatives or any of that. Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't learn um the utility industry, I, it was baptism by fire with Hurricane Hermine. Right. Because I wasn't there long at all. Uh, I started in July, um, and then I went through a, uh, the onboarding there, and then Hermine hit, I believe, the first of September, and it was which was significant. It was. In this area. It was. But I had an amazing what I call he I still call him my guru. His name is Bill James. He has been a top one for over forty six years or so. And I met him during my onboarding process, and he just poured as much knowledge as he could into me because then I had to go out and speak on this to the public, you know, what's going on in Talquin. And so it, it was baptism by fire, but it was it was a good baptism. Mm-hmm. So I learned a lot. And, of course, my next two years that I've been there, I've actually – we've had major storms here lately. The last one, Dorian gave us a slight scare, but before that, Michael, right. and, and, you know, so – I'm still learning. You know, the utility industry is very unique. It has um, it, it has its own, um, you know, uniqueness about it that you have to learn their language. Like any industry, you have to right. learn their language. And so, but it's been good because I get to use my personality and, and blend that together. <laughs> so I want to talk about France. I want to talk about how you guys met, how that all happened, and your your happy marriage in life now just kind of. Tell tell me about tell me about what's going on now. Again, I I'll go back to my faith on this one. You know, one of the things that um in your faith walk, you know, if you, you begin to serve other people, you you be volunteer in different places and you, you get to give to other people and don't think as much on your issues and, and different things like that. That is how I met my husband. I was actually volunteering during, um, for my son's football team at the time and this um and then serving in that capacity as a parent, uh, parent volunteer. And I met him and he was coaching there. He, you know, his story's a little slightly different from mine, but we're going with mine today. <laughs> they always are. Right. <laughs> but we met there and we had a so lot of So you weren't of complaining about your son's playing time or no, something like that, right? Mm-mm. No, okay. no. And um actually we were actually watching a um a, a J V game. And I was serving as a as a varsity school parent, is this? Lincoln High School okay. here in town, yep. and um, I was serving uh, in that role there. And he was just standing there watching, and we just started talking, and you know, kind of hit it off. And um, there, it, you know, there it was it went from there. So, so did he ask you out on the sideline at some point? Yeah, he did. He did. He <laughs> asked me out. And we went to Wingstop. So. <laughs> nice. <laughs> So, Pull out all it, the, it did. All, you know, so, nothing but the best the first time. Yeah, that, so. that wing stop, and that's been good, it has been our, it is, and it's been our staple at, at every fo- after every football game. Oh, so really? It has been. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so he's a coach. He is at Lincoln. Okay. Well, now he's not at Lincoln anymore. He was at Lincoln, and um, currently he's at Gopi High School. So he is serving as the running back coach, although he was a receiver for Tulane University. He is a running back coach for them. And so it's been it's been a great roller coaster ride for him as far as just coaching. He loves giving back to kids right now. He's been working at uh, CCYS, CCYS, which is Capital City Youth Services. It kind of rebranded, but he's been there for eight years. He has an amazing ability to work with young people, and that's why he continues to to coach because he, you know, that's where his passion is: is to give back and always to take them to the next level in in uh, in life, not just in football. He just uses football as a means to get there. So, you know, that's one of the things that I, I you know, I, I love about what he does is because he, he, one, he has a patience of what I, I always say he has a patience of Job. <laughs> so do you all, both being athletes, do you challenge each other in any any athletic way? Do you like to run together for fun or anything like that? Well, we did run together for fun for, you know, just kind of getting in shape and then I think he got set back with injury, and then I got set back with an injury, and then you know, so we just kind of was like, you know, eh. but but we we kind of we play off each other a little bit, but I think most people always want us to challenge each other, and right. he says he's always going to win, even if he has to pull out every stop to <laughs> win, whatever it takes. So, you know, I just let him have that win. Yeah. We don't want it to get to that. <laughs> yeah, no. so, yeah. 
Um, I know you're you're active in the community. You serve on a lot of boards. I know particularly the Girls on the Run. Um, tell me a little bit about that. What is that um, program, and how are you involved? Well, it's funny. The, the name doesn't actually define what it is. It says Girls on the Run. Um, but it is a uh, empowerment program for girls third through eighth grade. And what it does, it helps them, to, it teaches them what the, the limitless powers that they have and also teaches them through a healthy way to, to achieve these goals that they set in life, to let them know, you know, let no boundaries hold you back from being a successful girl. You know, from learning how to overcome bullying, her, um, teaching you how to encourage the other girls that are around you and their uniqueness, and and then lifting a, each one a, each person up. And so for me, I was that young girl when I was in um, when I was growing up. You know, I was picked on because I was very thin, and um, I didn't I didn't look like some of the other girls that I actually went to school with. And so for me, giving back to those young girls who they feel like they don't have a voice and helping them learn that they have a voice and they have power, limitless power, that is key for me. So the the although the name is called Girls on the Run of the Big Ben, it, it, it's, it's on the run for, for greatness in life. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I think that that is what we need because my career path, though, was in communication. My first love was engineering. Oh, so <laughs> it's very different. <laughs> yeah. And um, so. That's I, a lot of numbers and stuff. Is, so that's a lot different. It is. And you know what? I was never encouraged to stay on that path. Mm-hmm. I was encouraged to go on communication path. But now I want to tell girls that are that young age at that grad. You mean grass- in college or earlier than that? Um, It was in college that they kind of deterred me or steered me in a different direction because mm-hmm. I really wanted to go in engineering. And uh, they probably didn't want you focusing on school that much so you could train and run. That was part of it because they said that during the time I would have to train was a time when they would have engineering classes. Mm -hmm. And so they weren't really willing to at that time to to change my running schedule, my training schedule. And so it was a conflict. You're still young, though. You can still be an engineer if you want to. I know. You know, I told my husband that the other day. I was like, you know what? I need to go back to school and um, go on a career path that is going to that. I can s- keep myself stable in that area that and everybody's going to have a need for me somewhere so <laughs> a girl a, a, a girl who can do communication and engineering that's, that's pretty sweet. that's pretty solid yeah <laughs> you will so, not have a hard time yeah so you've mentioned a lot of people by looking back in your life one thing or person that you think really changed or altered the trajectory of your life that led you to where you are today. oh my son by far my son Jalen he um oh, um it be, you become, or I became selfless. So it wasn't about me any longer. It was about him. So it changed everything about me from not being that selfish uh, athlete that you, unfortunately, some people can turn into to being that selfless athlete, you know, not doing things for myself, but for, for him, for my other family or, or friends or support group. And it, it, I would say that him and, you know, and of course, my faith in Christ. You know, those um, God giving me that him as my blessing to show me what was most important. Mm. That That's what changed my life. And he made you a faster runner. He did. So. He did. I, gave, I got better after I had him. <laughs> <laughs> I tell him he was always, he was my gift and my blessing. So great things happen. That's awesome. Um, mm. All right. So the name of this podcast is How I Got Here. So we look at where you are right now. Where do you think here might be in three to five years from now? Uh. Three to five years from now, I want to stand up and be, um, I want to be, I want to train people in leadership skills and um, empowerment and motivating them and letting them know that the talents that they have, they can sell above um, and become great in that area. That even if you don't see yourself as a leader today, you are a leader to someone. And I want to let them know that. So, you know, everybody has a defined, uh, their own personal definition of what a leader is. But that leader can can be that person that you never even thought of. And, and I think that people get lost in that, you know. And I want them to know that, um, like I said with the young girls, but of course I also say young boys because I had a son. <laughs> um, it, it's just to I want I want to be that person. I want to be in front of other people and help train them to become great leaders 
and to reach within and use that that power that's within you and to bring it out and share with other people. Well, personally, I think you're already doing that. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. I think I want to do it. You know, I just I want to obtain that that um, certification. Because, mm-hmm. you know, in the, today's world, you got to have a degree So somebody telling you that you're good at doing what you're already doing. That's for other people. But for me, <laughs> we kind of know it because, Dave, right. that's why, you know, I'm, I'm partnering with you today, you know. Yeah. But, you know, other people have to say it for you. Like right. you're saying it for me right now, and I greatly appreciate everything you've done and bringing me here today. It's, um, yeah, it's just giving me that opportunity and that platform. Can share, I, let's share that story together because you are helping me share my story with others. That was Mycel Green. I'm grateful that she was willing to chat about her Olympic experience with me because I know she doesn't love to talk about it. Not because she isn't proud of it. You could clearly hear how much representing her country means to her. But because she is humble and doesn't like that to be the lead of her story, she would much rather deflect attention to her family and the young women she is passionate about helping. Sounds like a champion to me. Thanks for listening to the show. You can subscribe at Apple Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, please leave us a review. It really does make a difference. Thanks to my amazing staff at Fiori Communications, who pick up the slack while I'm working on these podcasts, and to Troy Bloom for composing our theme music. You can hear more of Troy's creations on Facebook and Instagram at Troy Bloom Music. To connect with the podcast or suggest a future guest, follow us on social media or email us at podcast at fioricommunications.com.